All right, the bare bone basics now take us to resolution. We've covered primary interceptors, primary stabilizers, keeping with that three set cycle that cycles through itself and gives you op options and the fundamentals to work this system out through. With resolutions, uh, we typically want to go towards something called the S position. The S position was designed for handcuffing, but basically what you're doing is remaining in a position where you can keep your peripheral vision available to you. You can disengage in case there's more subjects that can be dealt with. If you're dealing with teams, it gives you a lot of options to anchor down this person without having to dog pile them, which is a big concern with uh, asphyxiating the person through just pressure of amounts of people trying to hold someone down. So the S positions uh, taking into account the safety of the subject you're dealing with, gets you in a position to, to handcuff, and like everything else in the system works within the system. So every Every takedown we do has that option to take the person to the S position. Can it go bad? Anything can go bad. But if the system's working, if it does go bad, you have other tools to go right back into what you did prior to reset the place and stabilize again and then resolve. With resolutions, the S position, I'll show you um, briefly. If Flex can go lie down a second here. Um, the S position is I want him sideways. I don't want him flat against the back. If the person's flat against the back, they can face me, they can kick, they can maneuver, uh, they're, they're able to fight a lot better. Okay, So if I have the S position, I've turned them, again, with the concept of outflanking, this way. So by outflanking them now, I, it's just like standing. If you imagine this, if we were both vertical, I have outflanked them. So nothing's changed. How I get them here, this is the S position. I basically want to be here. I can handcuff from this position. I can manipulate him. I can stand him up and move him towards his belly from this position. I can drop a knee if necessary upon his uh, jawline and neck if necessary. I can put more pressure on the ribs if necessary. Um, I basically, my goal to resolve this is to turn him on his stomach. This is a temporary spot where I know that I'm in resolution mode. This is conceptually or strategically a position where I'm trying to finish. I'm trying to stop this from whatever initially started. So really briefly, if I was dealing with a subject, depending on where it went, and I had to intercept, it could have been the handshake to a wrist weave. It could have been something that was a lot more uh, violent, which is a swing. I had to get some control once I intercepted. Once I went to here, there's a sense of control. We are doing verbal commands throughout the entire thing. I haven't mentioned it till now, but it should be common sense that I've been telling this person to stop doing what they're doing, or please sit down, or please come this way, and it, it escalated to this point now where we're in a conflict, we're in a fight of some kind, and I'm still trying to do my job. I do not want to hit this person necessarily at this point. I'm still trying to do my job and put my hands on him and control him, regardless of what he's doing. If I have a sense of control, I need to determine what the threat level is. So from this position, I'm now stabilized. We have to head towards resolution. So we're going to go backtrack a little bit towards our first stabilizer we covered, which is the underhook and pike, and show you how to get the, the S position from each of those uh, stabilizers, okay, and the things that will occur from there. Underhook and pike, I'm in here. Now, if he's human, meaning he doesn't have a third arm, a tail, third leg, fourth leg, he's just not going to do anything that that is you know, in my eyes, impossible. He's got three options from right in here. We call this a triple threat. This guy might have wrestled in high school way back in the day. He's drunk now, and he's aggressive. He sees legs. He's going to go for the legs. He's just going to try to tackle. Boom. Now, if my structure is correct, and you're working this correctly, and you've taken into account our working platform, I'm here. I'm, I'm at this angle. I am not standing in front of him like this, which gives him my whole body. I'm off to the side. This makes the tackle a lot harder. He's on his side this way. He's not facing me. I'm taking his head and pushing it away. In wrestling, the wrestler's going to keep his head center so he can move and have power behind his hips to take this person straight back and down. I've taken that away. So we're using uh, the people that train fighting the most are fighters. Regardless if street fights look like real fights or not, the bottom line is the people that train all the time to optimize what it takes to put somebody on the ground or knock them out or break a limb are fighters. And when you work with fighters, the optimum position for him to take me down is facing me, hip squared against mine, just like football and wrestling. Boom. Underhook and pike is taking that away. I have my pike locked out for that very reason. If it's bent and I'm using muscle and I haven't been working out and I don't have tricep power, he's going to face me and I'm going to have more chances of being on my back. Okay? This is locked out. The other thing is if I don't have an underhook and I have an overhook, it's easier to turn into me and I can't lift him and he's going to continue to coming in. I have an underhook for a reason. He tries to turn into me, I'm going to start rotating that position by lifting his arm. I'm also going to keep his head back with the pipe. That's all built into the system through our research, but I want to point out why it's there. Okay, I'm in this position. He goes to tackle. This is the movement. I'm going to continue bringing his head to the floor like that spiral. As I spiral down, this underhook is going to pull. 
I'm going to walk behind him and pull on the underhook, setting him down right to the S position. Show that from different angles. I have an underhook and pike here. Let's go from this angle. I'm off to the side. He comes down. Head pushes straight down towards the floor. It's where he wants to go anyway. As his head goes towards the ground, I'm going to pull this. I'm going to walk behind him, set him down, and keep this underhook to set him into the floor. If you notice, I keep the underhook to the last moment. As I'm going down here, if Fletcher's are here, I'm carrying him here. As I step back and place his body on the ground, I'm carrying this position. As I set him down, I pinch my knees. Can I stay here? Yes. Can I come down? Yes. Is the person that's being taught this almost retired? He's got his bad knees. He's got bad knees and keep him up. Because what he's going to do is, we'll show you, it's getting him prone. He's going to start using different ways to manipulate the body. Okay. That's the tackle. The other thing that can happen is, from an underhook and pike, is he can lift his head up and just start swinging at you. You know, he's just in a denial, um, I'm not going to listen, if you push my head down, I'm going to push it up. It's typical when someone doesn't want to do what you're telling them to do, if I pull, they're going to they're gonna go that way, opposite direction, you know. If I push, they push back. That's a fight. So same concept, underhook and pike, I got my traction, I'm pushing his head away, pulling his underhook in. This guy, as I push his head down, wants to come up. And that's common. Initially, when he first gets his tactic done to him, it's a shocker. I just impact it with a dive or a helmet. Bam! And all of a sudden, I'm boom! I'll get this to begin with most of the time. Once you're here, though, if you delay in acting, sooner or later they're going to go, I don't want my head down. Depends if I'm strong or not, whether I can keep that head down. But if I can't, I'm buying time. As he's lifting his head up, though, I can feel that. Just like with the wrist weave, I can feel him extending. I'm buying some time. With the ISR, your eyes aren't as much um, a factor because you need them to, to gauge your, your surroundings. Your body's telling you what you're dealing with right now. Okay? So he starts lifting his head. Look at all the time I have. Now, from here we got several options. I can hit, which we're going to discuss later. But what I want to do is, if he's lifting his head up, it's to hit me. Typically what happens is he lifts his head up and swings, which is what he wanted, the hard drive. Okay? So as he goes to go this way, I want to turn away from it. If you notice, we go right back to the pocket. Everything we've been teaching so far. So if he swings at me, look. That's safety. That, that's the tactic, but I want to show you why the pocket's there. I'm here. He goes to swing. It's natural. You don't want to get hit. So everything we did from here. Flex said, you're working, you're training it. If my head's here and he hits me once, it only takes one shot to go, oh shit. And I'm back here. Okay, underhook a pike. If it's all bent and hits me in the face, it doesn't take much to go, uh oh. Okay, same principle. He's standing up. I bring my head to that pocket. All I'm going to do is... Step over to the side. His momentum is already going up. I'm going to go with it. On the tackle, his momentum is going down. I'm going with it. Simple, right? So I'm in here. He lifts up. I'm just stepping behind, and I'm reaping the leg, setting him down to that S position again. Here, he lifts his head up. Brush the face. Another option. This is the one I like. This is simple. Typically, what I do is if this person has clothing on, I stay on this side. I get my grips as he starts to lift his head up. So I'm here. Just, I get my grips. I send him over. Okay? Level is incidental. You can control it or you can force it upon him. Or what I like to do, if the guy doesn't have a shirt on and I've got some sense of control, it's just to lift up, is brush the face, elbow up as you come down. Okay? So as, as his head comes up, I brush it, elbow comes up, and then I punch the floor. Here. Okay? If you guys have done any judo, if we're here, we're in neutral. Fletch can throw me, I can throw him. By lifting up my elbow, trying to throw me, he can't. I have the, the advantage. So he who gets the elbow up first has a big advantage. The beauty of the system is you're always one step ahead. By me doing this, I can now know his head's coming up. Even if I don't do this one, I have the advantage of taking it down first. Okay, that's the second one. Tackling the legs, lifting up the head are the most common. Third most common is He's just bigger than I am, and he wants to squeeze my head. This, this guy might be, since kindergarten, used to give people newbies. He's used to just grabbing the head and moving him around that. If the pike is there, do it. I got some time. My sensors are telling me, meaning not my eyes, he's trying to squeeze my head. I can feel it. If my pike is wrong, he will crush it. Hence the mechanic and the platform. When he's doing that, I have plenty of time when he's squeezing my head, trying to bring his hands together to just duck under. There's my harness, shake the blanket, and all my controls from the back. A, a very common ground position, and it's usually the first ground position that we hit after some of the uh, some of the takedowns that we do off the back position, the dealing with the harness and the underhook and pike. 
So uh, first thing, I'm going to describe how the position is. I'm going to tell you why it's important that we use this position and some of the terminology that goes along with it. Freddie, if you could, you know, uh, I'm just driving back. I've taken somebody down and basically uh, I'm going to talk about the S position. We call it the S position for two reasons. Number one, he's up on his side and my body from my feet to the curve of my knee and my hip is shaped like an S. That's the, as far as just a, a, an esoteric reason why we do that. But uh, the primary reason for S is it's a safety position. Law enforcement circles, uh, the, the term positional asphyxia is, uh, is, is definitely making its rounds. We don't want somebody laying flat on their back or flat on their stomach, definitely not prone, uh, any longer than is reasonable. As soon as they're under control, we try to pull them up on, this, uh, up on their side, even if they're handcuffed. That's so we can monitor their breathing and make sure that they, uh, they continue breathing, they have a positive airway and uh, any use of drugs or anything like that isn't influencing them going into a coma or anything like that. So we make sure that they're in an S position to get them up on their side. Uh, very, very important that basically what I do is I pinch with my knees. I'm not riding on his neck with my knee, although it kind of looks like that at this point right now. The pressure is on, his, uh, is on his upper arm and his shoulder, and if there's any weight at all, it's on his floating ribs underneath here. I don't apply any pressure to the neck unless I have a good justifiable reason to do so, and that might be him reaching for a weapon or something like that. If he's reaching for a weapon or whatever, then obviously I can ask him what he's got, whatever, and uh, do something uh, for enough of a distraction in order, to, uh, in order to disengage. Now, how do we get to the S position? We'll look at what we call the triple threat. That basically comes from the underhook and pike. Assuming we've already gotten to the underhook and pike in this position, we've got a good underhook and pike. I've got control of the ball of the shoulder. I've got a locked out, exaggerated pike, making sure that he can't collapse it and he can't crush it on me. The first one that I basically show is the most, most obvious thing that somebody's going to try to do is just going to try to stand up. Well, if he's try, if he tries to stand up, which way is his energy going? His energy is going this way, towards the back. So I'm just going to run with that. As soon as he starts to turn in, the very, very common thing is all I want to try to do is I want to turn into him to where I'm running parallel. I'm going to face him towards his back. He's facing this way, I'm facing this way. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to bend the arm, get control of the upper body, and step through all the way down to the S position, and these go back together. A different angle, underhook and pike, having bent over, broken the vertical plane, he starts to stand up. As he stands up, all I do is I step through, all the way down to the S position. That's the most common, um, and it's just taking advantage of the direction that he's going to go. You have to be able to play with the different energies the guy gives you. Um, another one, very, very common, is uh, if he has any kind of uh, grappling experience, the most obvious target is for him to reach over and grab my legs. Uh, when he does that, as long as I have a good solid control over his shoulder, I have a good lever here. Very important also that I have a good pike here. As he's driving down, he can't help but, dry, but dip his head because he wants to try to get up under me. As he does that, I want to stuff the head down and step around the head. And the harder he comes after my legs, the easier this technique is going to be. So as he starts to go, go ahead, he ends up corkscrewing his way around. And if, uh, if he does end up partially flat, the way I get him back up on his side is just basically cinch up on the arm. Again. So we're going from the underhook and bite. He reaches for the legs and he dives hard. The harder he goes, the easier the technique is going to be. That's probably the fanciest looking technique that we do. And uh, most people are really amazed at how easily it turns out to where the, the bad guy is actually doing all the work. All you're doing is providing the direction and giving them a direction to go. Now the last one that leads us into the harness. Very common, he tries to uh, put me into a headlock. He just tries to squeeze. And if I have a good pike, it's going to give me a lot of room, a lot of, a lot of time to do this. But all I'm going to do, if I feel that it's collapsing, is I just duck my head, go up under the back. The arm that's underneath stays underneath. The other one goes around the back, and we have the harness position. We go to the uh, gable grip, and we're prepared to go ahead and dump him here, or, or check in the blind. All right, so quick review on the triple threat. Regardless of how I entered it, and I'll show you different options. If he swings at me, here's the uh, element to underhook a pike, and then depending on what he gives you, you do with a triple threat. Uh, if I end up with a harness in the back, it's the same principle. And we already showed you how to shake a blanket, dump him. But even if you do that one, for example, if I go with the harness, bump him, and turn him, like we've stated, what's going to happen is if he lands, he's got S position. If I do shake the blanket and I take him down, I'm just going to add a turn, a turn to it. So as I shake the blanket and I'm pulling, 
I'm going to start turning and moving into the side, still getting to this position to begin with. Okay, that way I can, I can monitor the S position. Now, when it comes to resolution, and we'll get into it uh, near the end as far as strikes go, would this be a takedown? He's already been violent, we've gotten into a fight, he's hit me, I'm already here. Can I do proactive and reactive with the ISR? I've already stated yes. So once I have this position, let's say he doesn't tackle me. Let's say that this is somebody I want to take down and I am of equal weight or I feel like I'm, I can do this uh, physically. I'll at least try it. I'm gonna, all I'm going to do is I'm going to tug, pull his head down to me, and then as, he, as I pull him to me, move around the back and force the yes position that way. So that would be proactive. I'm in here. Nothing's happening. Maybe I need to move to something else. Somebody's coming this way. I'm going to duck under and go to harness proactively. Okay? So he didn't have to squeeze my head for me, for me to move behind him. He doesn't have to tackle me for me to do that spiral down in that position. It, it, you know, ducking under as far as the headlock, same thing. He doesn't have to get me in a headlock. I can force that situation. I can soften him up and then do it this way and then move it down towards that position. So a triple threat is something you can do reactively uh, or proactively when you're working with somebody. Okay, going with the S position, we're gonna talk about our resolution on the ground. We've got a good solid S position. Remember that my knees are together on the shoulder. If there's any weight at all, it's on his floating ribs over here. It's not on his neck unless I've got a good justifiable reason to put pressure on his neck. And that would be he's pulling out a weapon or something like that that I need just enough time and space to go ahead and disengage. If I was going to disengage in this position, what I'd generally like to do is I like to push him in the direction away from me and push him over that way. That gives me maybe an extra step in order to create the distance that I need. From the S position, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way into what we call a ground pin, which is going to be arm wrap. Uh, arm wrap, once I start getting into it, you're going to start seeing uh, different things that it's going to uh, take away a lot of the dirty tricks that people say that you can, that you can run into from, a, from any kind of close quarter tool, such as spitting and biting and stuff like that. Um, from here, I feel that I'm getting, that he's getting a little bit out of control. He's trying to get his arm back. What I want to try to do is I'm going to hold on, to basically like a reverse baseball bat grip. I'm going to drive his arm over in front of him and I'm going to jump down into a push-up position. I want to get my weight of my torso on the back of his elbow as soon as possible. So as I drop down, push it out. Once I get to this position, I'm gonna, my, the weight of my, of my chest is on the back of his elbow. It's going to be very difficult for him to get his elbow back in order to get it underneath me. This arm comes up under his neck and grabs his wrist. As soon as I can, I jump right back up to knee. And this gives me awareness. I can see what's going on around me. It also protects me from getting bitten or being spit at. Okay. If, if you notice, I've got a second flex there. If you notice, that could be a go-to. It depends where you're at with what, where you're working in your environment. But perhaps I'm dealing with other people. Someone's got a dog, they're letting off a chain or something. He wants to get his elbow to the ground. Well, common sense, I'm going to disengage. As he tries to yank his arm to the ground, I'm going to pull it that way and I'm going to back away and deal with what's happening if I have the tools to deal with that. But generally speaking, if it's me and this guy and we're working in here or there's enough of, of my group to, to deal with what's happening, what I'm going to do with this guy's flexes is he's trying to get this arm, he's kicking all over the place. As I plan it this way and I drop, I'm immediately going to feed wrist to wrist and then using my hand on the elbow, ratcheting him over a bit so I can have, again, more outflanking. Uh, Fletch mentioned you don't want to have the person on their belly longer than you have to. Um, it's, it's easier to cough when they're on their belly, but immediately you, you'd have to uh, deal with the fact that they, you could be suffocating them. But in my case this way, I want him away from me. So when I land like this and I feed wrist over to my wrist, I push on his elbow, I ratchet him to this position, I want to make sure he's facing away from me so I have completely outflanked him. From here, I can continue to ratchet him over to his belly if need be, but for the most part, I've controlled everything he can do to bite, spit, reach for me. The other hand he tries to reach for me, if you notice, the distance is really, really less safe for me. If he continues to reach for stuff, I can grab that as well. It gives me a big sense of control, and this S position is something that we use all the time. Um, especially if it's one-on-one -on -one or it's a team of you trying to do it. And then I don't have to dogpile this guy. When we're talking about resolution for law enforcement, you'll do the uh, takedowns to S position that you saw earlier. But if you're working security guard or you're working inside a club or something like that, if you're a hospital orderly, you're usually transporting the person somewhere, the patient somewhere, the subject somewhere, and they're going to get unruly and you need to keep control of them and then take them out to perhaps an officer working detail, 
or to another room perhaps where there's more people to help you um, with the transport. So the rest of the resolutions I want to show are basically uh, transport oriented. The takedowns remain the same, shake the blanket, uh, it, you know, from the backs, obviously a good one. From wrist weaves, turning them down towards the ground. Um, there's many takedowns you can use, but uh, when it comes to stuff that's not law enforcement, we're going to keep away from the cuffing right now. So I'm going to bring in Cody. Uh, I brought in a couple guys today that work security. What you're going to do with our escort is a typical escort would be here and here, two points of control. We've discussed this earlier. Many ways out of this. If he gets me, for example, one here and one cup behind my, just go to go in the back for now. If he goes in this position, the reason that I don't like this particular hold is it can work and there's ways to manipulate me, but there's many ways to counter, branding the elbow, stepping behind, picking up a leg, taking the person down and so forth. So we like to have a little bit more control. So rather than just two points, I'm going to take up the entire back of his arm with my body. Again, uh, and, uh, this is a security thing, maybe at a club, you're walking this guy out, you know, you, you pretty much talk to him, this guy didn't swing at you, this guy wasn't violent at first, maybe on the way out he's changing his mind and we'll do that in a second. But this is my basic control point. Typically, if he's going to change his mind, he's going to want his arm back, or he's going to take a swing at you, or he's going to pull away. The pulling away part, I just follow. So if he pulls away, I'm just going to follow. But if he just brings his hand back because he wants to keep talking to me, he could be drunk, I let it go. So if he brings his hand to him, I, I go with it. If I need to uh, put the wrist weave on, I push it. Either way, it's the same energy, so I'm going this way. So if he becomes a little bit unruly, I'm not going to wait for him to do that, but that's very natural. I'm just going to go into his chest, then lock the wrist weave, get to a position of safety back here or in the pocket, and then I'm going to keep this and continue moving him along. If it becomes a fight, my tools are basically to lock in here and use knees to very safe and very legal. In every other establishment I've ever worked on, you're allowed to knee the thigh, and that's going to soften him up. Um, hopefully, again, you're working with a crew or a team of guys, and you're just basically holding him there for a moment so somebody else can come in. So again, you're walking this guy out, he starts to get unruly, you go to a wrist weave, go to safety position, you continue to walk him out while talking to him. If he gets violent, these are your shots. You can transition the harness, shake the blanket, and other tactics like that. Okay, using the same resolutions uh, by using our stabilizers to resolve the situation. This could be somebody outside someplace we need to move. This could be a group of people protesting. We'll deal with the hand being held. But right now, all we're going to do is we're each going to take a wrist weave. When you work with team tactics, there's a team leader who's going to call it out in advance, or we can call it out in the moment. If I'm team leader, I'll say double wrist weave. So we're going to go wrist weave. We're going to go in here for a wrist weave. And as soon as we get a wrist weave, I just get my hips underneath me, I apply pressure on the wrist, and then lift this guy up. And as soon as we get him up, then we're going to start transporting him or moving to other stabilizers to escort him Continuing out. Continuing on with resolutions, we deal with subjects. Uh, Greg's going to be playing an unruly subject here. Rather than both of us coming in, trying to, let's say we're trying to, trying to grab him and getting hit and dealing with this kind of mess, what they're going to do is uh, Nathan and Cody are going to come in with double helmets and secure some kind of stabilizer. Then they're just going to escort them out with whatever stabilizers they have. Okay, So it'll play out with Greg, you're against the wall. He's unruly. These guys double helmet. Go. Then they lock in whatever they lock in. In this case, double underhooks. And then they can walk them out. Can I have Cody go to transition to the harness? So he's going to control it. Go. Switch the harness, sand him up, good. Switch the wrist weave, take him out. Go, double helmet, double underhook and pike. All right, Nathan, go to wrist weave. Cody, harness, lock it, break, good. Break. Okay, we've shown you some things that are team tactic oriented to, to transport the person out and deal with the fact that they're going to be resistant. What usually happens though is there's a point in time where you're talking to this person, you've asked them to put their drink down for example so you don't get a bottle on the side of your head or whatever and you need to put your hands on them at some point and say they got to go. So typical things that happen is going to be a handshake which is a fake, he shakes my hand and he doesn't even know what he's doing, he might be doing it reluctantly and he starts pulling away. As soon as he pulls away this becomes an underhook and I go underneath. Now, I don't let go of the handshake until the last moment. So if I'm shaking his hand and he realizes what he's doing, he pulls away. I keep that, this hand comes underneath, my head goes right to here. At the last minute, release the grip and I have under a pipe. Or I can physically grab the wrist. If I grab the wrist, that's usually the first reaction you're going to get because they don't want it. They might even pull it early. So I go to reach, it just pulls away. And that's typical. All I'm doing is I'm sitting on my underhook and pipe to control him. So when I reach and he pulls away, I'm going under. Don't let go of the wrist if you can. Because if I've got a good bite, even if he tries to turn over, that's enough to stop it for a split second. As soon as he tries to pull, I hold, this hand comes in, I start turning the corner. Incidental, if I hit him, but my head's going right into the pocket, underhook, release, lock, duck under, or switch your grips, okay? If I reach with the same side, then it's a little different. As he pulls away, I, I hold it to the last minute, 
I make sure I'm covered in case he's swinging with the other hand. So if he swings, I'm at least covered there. So when I reach in here and he pulls away, I'm covering, going to here. The cover then becomes the pike, and then you continue to manipulate the And we learned that, man, you know what, I might not be able to beat that guy. You know, I might not be able to beat the 6'2", the 240-pounder with 6% body fat, but I can hang. And in this line of work, all I have to do is hang on long enough for another guy to get on. Okay. We're going to work a little bit out of the S position. This is a safe position. This is a, uh, the beginning of the resolution of, of the resolve state. And what we're doing here is I'm trying to isolate his arm. Almost all of our throws end up in this position. Uh, ideally, I want to end up with one knee controlling his body, slowing down the movement of his hips, keeping him pinned down to the ground. Allows me a chance to rest. I don't want to put too much weight on his head because I don't want to cause permanent injury. What I want to do is kind of pinch together here on the shoulder and isolate that shoulder and keep my weight pushing in this direction. What this does, this gives me a couple, a couple things I can do here. One, I can get a head up, look around, look for friends, family members that might be, you know, objecting to the arrest. Uh, gives me a chance to communicate with them too. Let them know they need to back off. Uh, I can also communicate to my other cover officers and, and partners. I also, if I don't have anybody present at the time, I can get on the radio. This gives me a chance to relax for a second, let him wear down, burn some energy get on the radio, let them know my status, where I'm at exactly, and so they can come in and help me out. Now, from here, there's a couple ways I'm going to finish this, and we're going to show you how we came to these conclusions for our finishes, how we came to the place where we said this is how we're going to finish a guy, this is the safest and easiest way. Again, all of this came out of a live training, training with somebody resisting me, somebody wrestling against me, working against me to defeat the arrest. Um, a couple of things that we've learned um, were based on stuff that works, you know, Aikido-like throws and turns where you use the guy to turn him walking around the head to turn him over to his back. And that works good against a guy who really doesn't want to fight or resist. Um, you know, your passive resistor, your give peace a chance guy who's just basically laying there and he knows he's going to be arrested and he wants to be arrested. But against a guy who's more active, resistive, active, combative, as I start to pull up, pull away from this guy, he's going to turn and I'm just going to catch a face full of boot. Um, again, our objective is to go home at night. And as you can see, these boots are pretty, uh, they're going to do a job. Man. Uh, they're really going to tear me up. Another one is uh, to try to clamp down here. Again, the same thing. If I try to come here and control him with pain, it's just not going to work. A guy who's already jacked up, who's already, you know, he's already got his adrenaline dump going, he's not going to feel these little pains. What's more likely going to happen is he's going to fight me, and I'm going to roll, and then I'm going to have nothing. And the stomp is going to begin again. So, and again, we'll cover this more later. Uh, pain compliance only works to a certain degree, and then after that you start to break things. So it's better to work off of leverage, um, principles that are tried and true in sport. Everything's based in physics. If I can get a, uh, an advantage to leverage on him, it's safer for both of us. Okay, so what we have found to work almost every time against resistance is I'm here, I'm holding my weight on him, head up, 
control my breathing, get myself back in the game, and I'm just going to put one hand on his wrist, grab my wrist, so we call it a double wrist lock, wrist, wrist, and I'm just going to turn, use my body and turn against this, and just walk around his head and talk to him, tell him I need that arm behind your back. We'll do it from this side so you can kind of see. Again, if you look from the side, right here, head up in the S position, head up, breathe, look around, break that tunnel vision, wrist and wrist, and then I'm just going to turn, take a step, turn, and it puts the wrist right on his back, and you can see I have control of him. That is important is that you always have to have room to uh, move it up to the next level. So if I am in here with a guy and he's just a beast, he's roided out, he's a Alright, from the S position, uh, I'm going to go over another uh, way that you could resolve and go towards cuffing uh, by turning uh, the subject belly down. Uh, this is something we call arm wrapping. Uh, it's a tighter approach as opposed to when you do the bent arm levers and you're actually working to turn the arms either way. You're still somewhat elevated um, on the arm wraps. You're actually going to have be a lot closer. Uh, it's a moment in time, but it really guarantees that you get that arm tied up. Uh, what we like to do from here is the same thing what Paul was stating is once I'm under this in this position, uh, I'm assuring that the elbow is against my uh, stomach. That way he can't turn into me. Okay, I've got weight on that elbow. Secondly, if he attempted to, I can lift this up as a lever, as a handle, and make sure he's still somewhat sideways so I'm still on top. My weight can vary on what I need to do. If this was a situation that was really turned up, I could press down on his head and neck, but for the most part, most of my control is going to work on the upper body and on his hip to keep him pretty much stabilized. What we do from here is, once we've arrived at this position, is we immediately uh, fall towards the elbow, okay, towards the tricep area. So once I'm in this position, I drop down for a split moment. His elbow's stuck. He's still monitoring this hand if he's reaching for anything. This is a split moment in time. From here, all I'm going to do is grab his wrist from underneath his head and immediately use his arm, the floor, or his body to get right back up to that S position or uh, knee up to this position here. I've got control over his body. I still have visuals for my surrounding. I can still talk to him. I don't need to go into any kind of uh, striking or anything else. I have complete control. He cannot strike me. From this position, all I'm going to do is put all my weight on his elbow and roll him. Not in one motion necessarily. I can roll him a little bit, place my knee down. Roll, place my knee down until I get him belly down. So once I've arrived at this position here, I can immediately just drop down on this arm here. Control everything. Grab the back of his wrist come back up by placing weight, I can roll him over to this position and take him all completely belly down. Still monitoring my environment, still having access to my tools. Okay, talking about the S position and, and some of the things that we have experimented with and found work and do not work. And th again, this is not a critique against any agency or against any training group out there, but this is just to say that we have tried these methods against resistance in the gym with guys rolling against us. Guys have no idea whether it should work or should not work, so they didn't know how to cooperate which is what we're going to run into on the street. And we found things, certain things work every time, certain things never work, and certain things just have such a, a great uh, amount of danger for injury associated with it, it just wasn't worth it to work on it. And one of those is where you come in and you basically softball into the back of the guy's arm. It's like a pitch. You just hit your arm into the back of their arm to try to turn them over. And what we found was over and over again, the only way to make it work was to just hit it. You just had to go hard. and According to what study you read, you know, 8 pounds or 11 pounds of pressure is all it takes to snap this elbow. Um, what we found more often was that we just hyperextended the elbow, caused damage to the guy's bicep because we popped that arm and, you know, the guy's like, ah, your training partners, you know, guy gets up and his bicep is just black and blue from where it popped it. So I can't imagine being in an adrenalized situation where I'm just pumped and I'm trying to control myself, get an arrest, and I come in and hit this thing and just snap that arm. The other thing we found was if you go soft, we're like, okay, well, can we use it as a soft technique where I just, you know, turn over, sir, turn over, sir, turn over. And what happens is you get a guy who uh, is flexible and can move a little bit, and you go in here and you go soft, he starts doing this, and then we're in trouble. And so those are some of the reasons why we don't use that one, and we've elected to go with some of the, some of the easier things that give us either a high percentage every time it's coming to this position, either using the arm wrap or using the bent arm uh, lever to move his arm behind his back. Those things at high percentage work every time with little chance of injury to either myself, my fellow officers, or to 
the subject that we're trying to arrest. To able to control situations without dying. So from that S, some people will stop here, continue talking to them, or you uh, set, uh, you know, make sure your environment's all clear, everything's going good. Um, as far as turning them over, using you know all the traditional, we used to call it the softball, we pitch them over. A lot of, with us, a lot of uh, damage to the bicep and elbow. With us, just training. So I don't like that for that reason. By all means, it's taught, it's it's legal, use it. But for training wise, everybody got torqued up because I'm going here and this guy's resisting and then there's only one. You can't do this softly. You gotta go like a softball pitch. So rather than do that, we like going in. Plus I got more control over him. Okay, when this, sometimes you yank your elbows to the ground, then you get into this kind of stuff. All right, and then you lost what you had initially anyway, which was here. So I'm, we like going in this way and coming up. And now if he's sideways completely here, belly up, let's say he's like this, I wanna turn him, when I push, my knee goes back, push, my knee goes back, and it's like a ratchet, turn him over, okay? When we get him to here, we stay in this position, make sure you got your environment checked out, you got the wrist controlled here. If we're gonna take position, we don't take hooks, we're gonna take hooks on me. Get hooks. We don't do this, which they used to teach, especially the guys, the jiu-jitsu guys, we don't do that, because what happens is, he gets me here, he's got good control, now my buddies get off the porch and start approaching and start talking shit, he's stuck to me, he can't get up, try to get away. Especially from fat head, he's stuck, he's done. So instead of doing hooks, we do rides. So when I'm in here, and I drop control, when I start turning him over, I'm in this position, I'm gonna get, first of all, I'm gonna collapse him, which is here. Right, when I take my rides, it's here. Yeah. Wrestling rides, so instead of jujitsu. When I get this, if he wants to get up, I'm gonna grab this wrist, and I'm gonna pull it. Go ahead and stand up, and I'm gonna do a split with my legs. That controls him. The reason we like this is his buddy starts getting off the porch from over there, start trying to talk to me, I'm going to be here. Continue with my commands or access my tools and disengage. So what I want you to do is, from that S, get that arm wrap, start turning the guy over, but once you turn him over, get the knee there first so he doesn't get, get altitude. Once you roll him, get your rides in. Here. If he tries to get up, you're going to pull the wrist down and do a split with your ankles. There. Now his buddies start coming off the porch, back to knee ride, and disengage. Let's work it to that point. One of the common positions that we see uh, being taught is hooks to break down the uh, uh, subject and control them. Though it's a controlled position but between one on one, I'm really committed in this position. I can't monitor what's behind me. And if right now somebody does get off the porch, runs down the street, someone's coming, he actually has me pinned and I can't get away. And by being stuck here, I'm really going to take abuse. So I don't want to use this so much for that reason. Um, if I can, and I have a person broken down, this other point, I want my hooks on the outside so I can keep him down, access his hands. If he tries to stand up, I'm going to grab a wrist and I'm going to split my legs back down to keep him down. That's one option. Now, the second option is back of the neck and go right back to knee up. Now he can still bench press me because it's Paul. So when he starts to bench press, I need to take one arm out. So it becomes a one arm part bench press, which he can do, but he's not going to show up. One arm bench press is a lot difficult just because of the angle. Go. There. Okay, so once I do go from this position and I lift, you got to realize some people will be able to lift you up. So once I go here, I'm immediately going to grab that wrist and make it so he's got a one arm push up, which only Paul can do. All right, good position to control. You can watch my environment. Continue to control the arms. Get up. Access my tools. Back away. Uh, a lot of times, when we get into scuffles, we try to take a guy to the ground. Um, things just don't go the way we plan. You might end up in a. Uh, you know, a crossbody type position or a tackle position where you're kind of sprawled out here, you might be wrapped on the guy here, you know, however you ended up. And you want to get to a place where you can cuff this guy or talk to him, uh, talk him into a cuffing position. One of the, the best ways we like to get there is from knee up. So say we're in a tackle or a sprawl, whatever, things went bad, I'm just going to push myself up a little bit, bring my inside knee up and onto his stomach. Okay, so I'm going to put for for this purpose of this demonstration is my left knee and put it on across the stomach, push it towards the ground, grab his pants, hopefully he has pants on, 
and his shirt, and I'm just going to put some weight on it. This arm is trapped in close to my body. If this arm is down, he has it on his face. He's been sprayed. You know, and I'm talking to this guy, and I'm telling him, I need your arm, I need your arm. The second that he starts to bring that arm up, I'll go up into the S position or cuff position so I can resolve this. Um, this is good for guys who are really uh, resisting us, not really com assaultive, they're not really hitting me, but they're still combative. They're keeping, there's a lot of muscle tension, a lot of resistance happening there. When I go to the knee up, let's put pressure on his diaphragm, making it so he can't breathe. He's going to gas. And we all know from training in the gym that when you gas, you're done. So you can't really resist anymore. There's no muscle strength left. You're running out of air. So when I start making him gas, I start talking to him, man, I need your arm. I need your arm. Take your hands away from your face. I need your arm. He's going to give it to me. I'm going to move into an S position where I can cuff him safely and resolve this. Go ahead and move into my position. Um, I stay away with this position. I stay away from the chest just because you're getting too high up on the guy. There's a chance you're going to end up on his throat. You know, unless you, uh, unless you want to deal with the consequences of having to do a tracheotomy on a guy in the field, I'd stay away from this area. Down on the gut, that takes away, it puts pressure on the diaphragm, makes him breathe out on a physical specimen such as Lewis. It's going to take a while before you get that gut to, to die on him. But you're just going to push in, let him carry you, grab the pants or whatever cloth he's wearing, grab the shirt, you can grab a cross here. I got my heads up, I'm watching, I can see everything. You know, you, there's always going to be those, well, what about the groin shot, what about this, what about that? If the hand comes out, he goes in for the groin, I'm just going to bring my other hand, my other leg in and change up on him. You know, I'm just going to constantly be changing up, look for ways to protect myself. But again, normally in this situation, his arms aren't out here. Logically, if his arms were out here, where he could hit me in the groin or do some damage to me, I'd be in the S position. I'd take the arm. I wouldn't need to bargain for the arm. So again, this is going to be, his hands are here, he's covering. He might have his hands down here on the side. He might have even crotched something. And he's trying to dig it out of his pants to get rid of it. He's here, and I'm telling him, because I don't know if it's dope or a gun, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. You know, and I'm too close to disengage because of whatever circumstances. I can't disengage and cover him until I figure out what's going on. I'm in. And so in those circumstances, this is an ideal position where you have a heads up, Break the tunnel vision, look around, see what's around, communicate, yeah, I'm fighting with this guy, we're back here, you know, we're in the backyard of 264 or whatever, and uh, here we are, you know, and I can control him, I can see his hands, and then bargain him into a position where I can cuff. Flex has got a, uh, he threw me down, he didn't get on this side, please, he didn't get his S, in other words, he, he took me down and I'm facing up, okay, which is, you, you don't want this because there's too much things going on. Immediately, what he wants to do is set his uh, knee and shin on my belly. He wants to drop into this position. I just and you want to drop. He's being cool. You want to drop in because you want to knock the wind out of him. When he's in here, he's gonna get that. That's what I wanted because he can't. I don't think like he's here. You just took him down. He's on the ground. You don't want to start fumbling for the hands now because you're not gonna get him. Right away, boom. That's gonna make his hands meet in the center. Always. That's what you're gonna get right there. Immediately pick up that elbow. Go to your S or stay here, and then go to push-up position. Okay. So I just threw him. Boom. We're here. I'm not going to jump on him any other way. I can't even do this because I don't have an S. So I just throw him down, drop here, or pick up the elbow from here. Back to your ass, or immediately, as I land, as elbows come up, hit it. Right here. Again, and then ratchet, 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 and work. Let's try that. Another detail from a knee up position is you basically want to work this in a fashion that when I am pulling up on him, I am somewhat stabilized. This foot can uh, pretty much guide me where I need to go. I don't want anywhere near him. I want it kind of back here. Um, like Paul said, the jeans, the belt's an excellent tool. He's got a belt on to pull up on him, control. Um, I don't need to pull up even from both sides. Okay, it's obviously ideal if he's got a shirt to pull here, pull on his neck, but I don't even have to worry. If I'm really worried about his hands, I can control the hand, control the belt, and then just by pulling up in this area and driving my knee at an angle, a 30 degree angle towards the mat, I can actually start making him breathe a little harder, okay? So this is good enough. I can still monitor the hands. The good thing about this is the person who doesn't train, who's not familiar with it, when he feels pressure here, he can't turn into you because all my weight's on this side and stabilize. They turn and roll that way, they're actually, they're actually giving you what you wanted, which was their back, which is what we wanted to be anyway. And we'll get into hooking and controlling and riding from this position, but by them turning away, if you allow them to, they're giving you what you want. You can also prevent them from turning anyway, because since I do have the belt 
or the jeans. I'm stabilized back here. He tries to actually roll that way. I can pull him back. Okay, so you can just ride around control. If you ever needed to disengage and it all went bad, you're in a great position to do that. Just by pushing and launching off, you have enough distance. Okay? So it's a very excellent place to be. If, like Paul said, we landed here and we're wrestling, we're fighting for all these positions, right across the collarbone, so I don't have to deal with the bites, right to where I need to go. Right from the very beginning, I'm grabbing the handle, shorts, jeans, belt, right from right in here. I'm just going to pull it all up, pop, pull, okay? Control the wrist, ask for the arms, you give me the wrong arm, it's on the switch arms. If not, more pressure. When the right arm is there, right to my ass. Secondary, he's lying down. You've got your, uh, your, your arm wrap already in place. You're turning them. Again, you didn't get your knee in place in time. In other words, your knee's not on. So you rolled them like this. So he came up. And now you're here. See? You're back up. You just come right back. So you're outside. Drive in with the knee again. You just continue to attack them. Other thing that goes wrong sometimes, again, it's details. If I didn't put my knee in, that's what gives him mobility. But let's say I'm here. And he rolls to his knees. I lost him. We go right to harness. OK? One more time. I'll show you why in a second. I'm here. I didn't do something right. I'm fidgeting around here. He rolls. I don't want to keep losing them, so I just grab the harness and my knee's inside. We call this a side ride. My knee's inside here. Now, the second I'm here, I don't want to stay here and unless my partner's coming out of the car. Then I'll just hold on. Drop my head, you can't get my eyes. Wait till my partner gets there, okay? But when I'm in here, the second I get this, all I'm going to do is yank backwards, just like shaking the blanket. Right here. I don't want to talk to him. Turn this way. And when I'm here talking to him, if I need pain compliance, if he's going for my eyes, go for my eyes. I drop my head. I keep this here, right? And I just walk his head, forehead to his belly button. Arm wrap gone bad, basically, if you're going here. You're here. He spins on you. He loops right in here. Okay? Get your harness. All you do is switch. I like switching my legs. I'm here. Pull. Send him over this way. Okay, he comes up, nice and easy. You just talk to him here, but I mean, if you need to put pressure, just sink in with your shoulder to the head, okay? If you're in this position and your partner's coming, this is the only time you would do it, you switch your knees and pull and go to your back. I would never do this, okay? Unless it's just me, this guy, and my partner. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But you have that option. Don't use it. Other than that, if he's here, your best off from right here also is just disengage. Anyway, back again. You're here, your knee didn't place, he rolls, go, 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 side right. Right? You can also come around behind you. Right? Let's try that. Little variation. Dealing with the guy here. As Lewis already showed you, one position to deal with uh, taking the back on a guy. Another position is you just come in here and put put your, I put my knees right on their hips. Okay, I'm not putting pressure on their lower back. I'm not doing anything that's going to injure them. I'm just controlling their hips for a second so I can come in here for the harness. Coming right in here for the harness, and then I lock that in, and I move around, slide my knee in. Okay, either knee is fine. I'm just going to hold this guy here, and I'm just going to control him for a minute and just ride. Now, worst case scenario, he tries to roll me that way. He just tucks and rolls, and we're here, working our way towards the straight jacket and the arm wraps that we discussed earlier. Okay, so again, I'm always looking for worst case scenario, what puts me in the best position to deal with the circumstances I'm faced with at that time. And again, we're looking at it from, we all go home at night. You know, we do our eight hours, we do our 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever our shift is, and we go home, okay? And we also want to do that in a manner that we can't have this attitude of, I'm going home no matter what, that we lose our pension because we go overboard and hurt the guy, we do something that was unnecessary, we get sued. So again, it's no choke here, not causing any great injury to any part of his body. All I'm doing is controlling him. Okay, I'm coming in here, I'm harnessing his upper body, locking it down, protecting my gun, my tool, the bat belt, is away from his hands. I can pretty much monitor where his hands are. And I can hang on and ride with him. And Lewis greatly outweighs me. And so I'm able to control a guy who's a lot bigger than me and just ride him out. And here we go. Knee up, control, hold, watch the hands and tell him, let me have your hand. Let me have your hand. All right, let me have the other one. 
Brings them out. Knee up and cut. If I, if I have the harness, I'm going right under all the ability, his ability to bite. I'm going right under a cross. Okay, from right there, I'm locking my hands. No fingers exposed, so you can't reach your fingers. And from here, I have a great deal of balance. And if I need to adjust even further, we go into the side right. We bring my knees inside, either knee, and I just hold on. Now, from this position, several things I can do. If I can outpower or outlift the person I'm dealing with, I can sit them down and talk to them further. So from this position, I can actually pull and sit them down. Now I can see what's around me in that direction. I can still see his hands and monitor. I can go right back down if I needed to. If I am uh, smaller or weaker than the subject, I can just hold on. So it's a very good place to be at and, and register some kind of sense of control. Okay? So I'm still staying on to this position. Other thing that happens though is they'll turtle up because they're hiding something and they'll be balled up pretty tight. Can you turn sideways, please? So what I want to do is somewhat find out what's going on with the hands. I need to know where the hands are at and I need to keep visuals. But at the same token, I need to break them down or get a harness because the way he's at right now, he can explode, stand up, run forward, and I have no control. Can't really harness too well. If I can, I will. But right now, I can't. So what I'll do is I'll stay here monitoring the hands and I'll bring one knee across the heel and I'm driving the heel down to the mat which will make them roll. Uh, not so much pain compliance, just leverage on the entire leg, hip and knee area. Okay, so when I'm in here I might start off where I have control of the belt and the hips and I'm going to move and monitor. I'm just going to drop my knee on his heel. Just on the angle that I'm pressing in, it starts to break him down. From in here I can start sweeping the arms up, coming up, monitoring, coming to this side and moving around to keep an eye on the hands. From this side, sorry, please. from this side, what I'm doing is, from this position where I'm controlling the arms, all I'm going to do is step out and drop that knee right across. I can go slow with it. I can just ease it there. There it goes. As he starts to break down, I can monitor where his hands are at. Start looking to get knee up position and control. <laughs> Sportive situations is a great place for a one-on-one -on -one situation, um, but because uh, police work requires you to monitor your environment, there's usually other people around. I don't want to be here too long because I'm really my vision behind me is, is pretty poor. So what I need to do is get back to knee up. But while you're here, it, it, just some little details to stay on here. If it was one-on-one -on -one and you need to control the situation, have them turn. A couple of things I want to do is I want to have my toes touching underneath his legs there. So when he tries to buck me off or roll me. I stay on. The second thing I want to do is I don't want to sit on his hips because if he bridges, if the guy's done six months of wrestling, I'm going to be flying off. So what I need to do is keep my hips off about two inches so if he does bounce around, I can just pretty much ride because my hips aren't on. And then I can control the arms, which is what I wanted initially. Back to our arm wraps, if he's pushing on me and he's trying to get away and we're in this kind of situation, all I'm going to do is roll to one side or the other and basically clear one arm and drop on that elbow, which is what I wanted to do. And then I'm just going to grab the wrist. Go back to an arm wrap. From this arm wrap position, I'm controlling and monitoring his other arm. This foot goes to the ceiling and up, and I'm back to a very familiar position there or here. Okay, so one more time. Your basics, just to stay here and not get rolled, your hips are off of his, toes are together to lock in. You're basically riding him. When he starts pushing on you, just zig to one side with the wrist. Just push him to one side. Just be loose. And as I turn, I collapse on one arm. I can slap it. I can use my own body weight. Drop it. Slap. Grab. It's got your arm wrap, control the roll with the elbow or the wrist, come up, you got your arm wrap, or the yes position. But I'm here, and he jumps on it for whatever reason, you catch yourself in uh, good melt. You catch yourself here, whatever, here you are, right? Details, keep your toes inside, that way when he tries to throw you off, your feet catch, all right? Other thing is don't sit on the guy. If he's sitting on my hips and I just bridge, he's going to go. All right? Keep your butt off your, your subject, and then all you do is when he lifts, that little gap is all you need to, to give you forewarning. In other words, if he's sitting on me, I'm just going to send him off. If he's got some distance and I lift, there's no big loss. He's got some more sense of balance. First thing you're going to do is if he pushes on you, move his shoulder back. So his shoulders are here. If he's stiff as a plank of wood, I'm going to bench press him. Okay? So if he's stiff, I'm going to lift him. All he's going to do is turn his body. When he turns, he's going to use his body to come down and then wrap. Feed it. No, feed it. Don't use feed it with his hand. 
push it. There. Then he's going to grab the elbow and jump off the knee right. Or I like going to this, guys. Come back and get mine again. Stay with mine. I don't like staying here because I can't, I can't tell what's happening. He can't see what's behind him right now. And you got to do this fast. So come back. I'm pushing. He throws his body and he can push with the elbow. He can use his hand on my elbow to turn it. He arm wraps. He immediately goes to the knee right. Go ahead. Just to make sure that no one's sneaking up behind or, or he might be hearing stuff behind his back. He might be on. Once he's here, then he can start ratcheting it over again. And then, in other words, I don't want you to jump on the guy's back, take his back, and then you got people behind you and you don't know what you're aware of. So he ends up in mount. Here you are, okay? Guy's pushing on you, and all you do is hit, clap, grab the elbow, and push yourself up with that. Okay, good. Second thing is, like that second foot. Let's say he's not pushing on you. You're here. He's not pushing up at all. The knots right here. It's two fingers and push in, and that's what you're going to get. He's going to give you the arms, or he's going to grab your wrist. Right there. The second he grabs my wrist, I'm there. So what I like to do personally, and Paul uses it when we're teaching these classes, is the second I ended up in this position, which I don't like, by the way, I like being me up, or S, I just go here. The second the guy pushes on me, I smack the right elbow, come down, and then jump out. Or if he grabs my wrist, that's all I needed. When he grabs my wrist, I'm just going to sit up high, push here. Push on the elbow, make sure everything's good. Ratchet him over, get my rides in. And see how he's already starting to post? Don't worry about this no more, watch this. I'm gonna go for this hand, the hell with this, go. That elbow's stuck, as long as I keep my weight on. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, obviously, try to keep it, but if you don't, don't worry. This is the most important thing, because you don't want him to lift. Knock that out of the way. Then you can come back. He's just getting himself worse and worse situation, right? Just try that uh, mount position. Getting an arm wrap and getting out of the mount position. This is not very... They think, well, I'll train with jujitsu guys or I'll train with, uh, you know, this, this is the other. This is good for one-on-one -on -one sport. I can't see anything behind me. So if I landed here and they're already yelling, his family could be yelling. I just don't want that. I don't want, I don't want that hassle. I hear them. I don't want to stay here. I, don't, I can't really stand up because now he can grab my ankles. And everything else is going on, good, see? I don't want any of that to happen. So the second I'm here and I'm hearing stuff behind me, I'm going to do this and just dig into his neck, right there on the notch, and then get this. So I can move and see what's behind me, and tell him to back away, and, tell him, and I still have control over him. And I don't have to look at him. Because I have this, I know exactly where he's at, okay? Same uh, token is if he's got me cross body, I don't teach this. This is good, but you tackle them, okay? You're here. Get the hell out. Right. We want knee ride, we want that arm wrap. We want that right away. Or, or disengage, obviously, okay? If your job is one-on-one -on -one and you got to just basically cuff this guy, what he's going to do from this position is he needs to get out, which he's going to kill the arms. In other words, he's going to go for arm wraps. Let me try that. So he's lying down. I tackle him. Whatever reason, guys, here I am. Going for my thing, his elbow rips to the floor. I fall off balance. Here I am, whatever. Worst case scenario, I don't like any of this. Okay, right now, if I'm fighting for this, I, they used to teach this. I've seen this being taught. Reach up and get your uh, knife from your boot, for example. From your boot, underneath or over the top. Go ahead. I don't even know if he's doing it. But see, I can't see. So reach up and grab your over my body. Just reach. That's it. I don't know what's going on. I don't feel it. I don't see anything behind me. I don't know what's going on. So don't get into this mess, okay? So if I'm in this position right away, I'm going to go right inside here, grab, and I'm going to lift and jump on his belly. Boom! His arms are going to come up. Right? Hit that elbow. Go right back to your game again. So your first one. You're here. If it's a fight, you don't do that. Okay? You're if here, grabbing, grabbing, <clears throat> take them right back down, okay? Second option, you're here, pick up this elbow, right here, one, and I'm going to go bring this knee here. First thing you teach always, guys, is bounce on that knee, get out. Bounce on the belly, get out. It's a little bit, this will be intermediate, okay? Same basics, but from here, I go one, look. His arms are all tied up. Still, do I want to be here? Hell no. <clears throat> see? Then I keep one of the wraps and... Sorry. See that one more time? Yeah. Again, reality. Boom, I'm here, right? That's what I'm going to do. One-on-one, right. -on -one, I can handle this guy. All I'm going to do is one. So you sit. One. Two is this knee. Here. That arm's dead already, right? This one stay here, guys. 
This one stays here. Look what happens. Now when I'm here, I just want to pull this one across. See? See where I'm at? I don't want to stay here. I'm not scoring points or anything. I want to get my hands up. This is called straight jacket. I picked the arm I want. Try those two. Getting back to knee uh, up. Most of our throws will lead us into for resolution. Uh, like Paul stated way earlier that uh, not all the throws come out the way you wanted them to. Sometimes you're going to get into a wrestling match for a while. So a lot of uh, the officers I've worked with have a judo or wrestling background. Use a lot of head and arm throws. So you'll end up in this position. We don't want to be here, obviously, because now I can't see what's behind me. He has access to my eyes, punching. But you're in, you're in a fight now and you're down on the ground. So a couple things you can do is by grabbing the back of my head, this arm here, does it have much ability to do much damage, okay? And I can also monitor it. So this is going to be a split moment in time. When I am here, I need to move quickly. What we're going to do is, continuing on with the arm wraps, which is what we prefer to do, we're going to basically straight jacket the arms this time, which means rather than an arm wrap, which is one arm across, straight jacketing is when both arms are across. Much more ideal situation, but not always as easy to get as an arm wrap. From this position, what I'm going to do is simple. I'm going to step over with my hip and knee, this arm is now being arm wrapped, and I'm going to keep this arm with this hand. And as I pull here, I step over, and what's happening is his arms are being tied up, so by the time I conclude, I'm here, his arms are tied up. He doesn't have access to weapons, he can't punch. His breathing is a bit impaired, so it's going to, he's going to fatigue much faster. I'm a lot lighter, a lot lighter than Paul, and yet he's having a hard time breathing. From this position, I obviously don't want to stay here much longer. I'm going to control the elbow, I'm back up to the knee up position, then I'll work to get an arm to turn him over. One more time. We're here, we're in a wrestling match, I need to monitor this and get in my face. This arm is controlled because I'm over it this way. Okay, I can still tell where his hands are at by grabbing his tricep and elbow. This one's controlled here, I immediately step over, pull and pull. Come around, the arms are being tied up, my weight's on him. That makes his breathing difficult, so you get fatigue. I can talk to him. Immediately grab the arms, up, up, and I have my knee up. This, that happens is well, the idea of biting or being bit. Again, it's not foolproof. You're actually really close to your uh, subject right now, but a lot of things you can do that make biting very difficult. Just the speed of the movement doesn't allow the bite, but that's your concern. Once I'm in here, my leg comes across. His face is sideways, no bite. When I come around, his face is still sideways. When I come around this way, I need not go across the face to cause him to start gassing out. Just lift the head up. Okay, same principles, but it's just bite friendly. Okay? But if you feel that, and we're not doing it hard because you guys ate, you can completely uh, we're not. choke out the person with the pressure. So, but generally speaking, for law enforcement, you just want to tie the arms up, right. go from there. From the S position, that's straight jacket. Two arm wraps is a straight jacket, okay? Yeah. Simple. From the S, if I can handle, always, bottom line is, I'm dropping into a push-up position, I'm arm wrapping once. But if I'm talking to this guy, and he's, he's not really being too aggressive, but he's not giving it in completely. What if I want to straight jacket this, when I drop into here, see how I'm going to grab the wrist, right? Now I'm going to keep this elbow. See what I'm doing? And then I'm going to roll and get my ride like this. See? And I'm just going to turn. Uh, and all I'm doing now is just talking to him, and when I finally get him over, I got his arm straight jacket. Okay, so I wouldn't go for that unless the guy is somewhere in the middle, or in other words, I'm here, he's not turning, telling him to turn, I drop into this. Now I'm trying to force a turn, but that hand starts trying to hit me. Go. That's safe, okay? That's all you have to do. That's why I always teach this one first. But you're here, and before you've jumped up, he starts hitting you. And you just don't want to deal with it. He's in your eye already. He's in here. Pick it up. See? <clears throat> no, it sucks for him. This is an arm bar. You just locate the elbow. See? So just just keep in mind that I want to show you that because later on when you guys get the basics down, or if you go through an instructor's course with me and we have 40 hours, I'll teach you the whole thing. But this is what you want. But you're here and he hits you. Alright, guy. Nice. Turn. As we deal with getting the arm wraps, in other words, there's nothing more complicated than always trying to get knee right and trying to wrap an arm up. How you get good at it is by wrestling around. 
but now you're no longer wrestling trying to get mount four points for mount or two points for back because all you're trying to do is wrap the guy's arms up. Don't be a mount. And then for scenario training, what you do is you have four or five guys sit over there. You have your partner do the whole thing, intercept stabilizing. When he's re resolving, you call out certain of those people to stand up and you play, play scenarios if you want where they start yelling, hey, get off, that's my friend, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. That puts pressure on your partner. All of a sudden he's got mount and these guys are walking towards him. He better start hitting that notch, getting that arm wrap, going the knee ride so he can continue on. So that's, that's as far as that goes. If Fletch is lying down, and we got one of these guys, he's on belly down already. We've got him here. Rather than dog pile him, which is an issue that comes up, I got 10 guys on top of him, and he, he loses his consciousness and he's, oh uh, yeah. We do leg anchors. So let's say we're all wrestling on top of him. We call it anchors. Anchor the right leg, anchor the leg, anchor any leg, you know, just anchor a leg. What it is is we got a bunch of guys working with this guy, we'll do this. That's all we'll do. I'll try to get away. Now the other guys can get off. Get off, I got a leg anchored. He's not going anywhere. I don't care how big he is, I'm just gonna bring my knee down, see? It's pain compliance, it's complete control. It's a leg anchor. So if we've got four or five guys trying to wrestle this guy, and we can't even see what's going on, whose hands, what, or what's a mess going on, yell for an anchor. Anchor a leg. Well, you guys already know these anchors, which are arm anchors. You guys use these already. But you can start yelling. We've got four or five guys on this guy. Anchor an arm, anchor a leg. And then when you've got an anchor, say that's like, when you have an anchor on this guy, just call it out. Just tell me I'm an anchor. Once you have an anchor, try to get away. Try to run away. That's it. I don't care if he's on PCP, he's drunk off his ass, it's just leverage. All I'm doing is every time he lifts, I'm bringing my ankle that way. <clears throat> See? Pain compliance, you have to do this. It starts attacking the knee. It starts separating the kneecap, okay? Don't need to go, oh, a jiu-jitsu guy. Foot luck. None of that shit, you know? Just you got a leg anchor, grab the belt, talk to the guy, and lean forward. That's all you need to do. Anchoring, whether you do it this way or this way, is not is it not an issue, but stand up a second. It doesn't matter which leg you cross with. You don't want to get too detailed because people feel like I'm here. Remember this one? Remember that? The second I drop them in here, I just place an anchor. But I don't, why do this if you're solo? Because now you're like, damn. Okay, you can start asking for his hands to cuff in your hands, see? Because that's the pain. That's one option. But reality, so I just took this guy down. He's, he's all over the place. My whole thing is to get up in here, control, look for the arms, and everything else. Two or three officers on one guy, don't dogpile him.